terroir to us at um, Terroir Talks, it's about a sense of place uh, that it encompasses um, regional landscapes and culture and traditions, not just, you know, soil and, and earth and, you know, what, what grows where, but the background of that, the um, holistic picture, the big picture. Um, so this is going to be very interesting. I'm very, very happy to introduce our two, um, some amazing, amazing growers from the Erla region, uh, Pellin, who has, uh, who is the owner of olive oil, olive, Orla. Olive Orla. Olive Orla. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Gay, um, who is the owner of Erlis Winery. Ulige. And, say that again, pronounce it properly for us. Ulige. Ulige. Ulige Winery. And Ismail, who is from Cultura. And uh, so thanks very much for being here, you guys. Um, I'm very, very um, excited. Now, as I said, what terroir means to us, you know, landscape, tradition, culture, sense of place, that sort of thing. What, what does it mean to you? Um, Bill Gay, do you want to start? Sure, of course. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I want to say hi from Urla. Well, we're on the western coast of Turkey, and it's the peninsula that stretches out onto the Aegean. It's like we're on an island, and uh, we are only connected to the mainland through a, a narrow uh, strait. So uh, to us, uh, in the wine world, or in the wine lexicon, uh, you talk about the soil, the uh, climate, the winds, the, the effects of the sea, the urinal temperatures. So I will start with those, but I know that, you know, to you, terroir encompasses uh, a lot more than that, uh, which is culture. And also in winemaking, it, uh, terroir also uh, contains people because they are part of the winemaking effort. So without people, you can't have wine, no matter how good the, the soil or the climate is. So um, we are on the 38th parallel and it's a choice for many, many civilizations. Uh, it goes back to the um, uh, Neolithic age, to Bronze Age, and then to Aeonians who lived here, to Romans, to Byzantians, Ottomans, and now the Turks are living here. And uh, because of the climate and uh, the fertility of the soil and the uh, richness of the sea, um, this is a choice location. Um, here, uh, I'm going to talk about wine more because that's what I grow, uh, wine grapes. And uh, the soil is very important for growing grapes. In fact, uh, olive oil, uh, olives, olive trees and grapes have been uh, a part of the landscape since uh, a very long time ago. Pelin can tell you how old some of the uh, olive trees date back. Uh, and we know that from the Iskele, the, the little harbor of Urla, that they were um, exporting um, wine and olive oil in Ankara to most part of the uh, uh, Aegean, to Black Sea, and all the way down to the coast of Egypt. So there was a lot of trade going on in uh, years such as maybe 200 uh, years before Christ. So there's a lot of history. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that the, the reason for making wine and olive oil is uh, mainly the climate and the, the, the soil because there's a, the, a beautiful chalk and calcium in our soil, which 
absorbs moisture and throughout the growing season, uh, even though you don't irrigate, you can uh, grow all these produce without irrigation. So also I want to talk about the fish, which is a part of the diet, because like I said, we are uh, on a um, peninsula. And also as far as uh, meat goes, uh, we don't have large meadows to, to, to grow uh, wheat or, uh, or uh, you know, feed uh. cows. We mainly have hilly, rocky, undulating landscape. And um, for this reason, uh, people around here just grow or raise lambs and goats. Almost everyone here at one point had goats or <laughs> lamb in their garden. And fruit trees are very important because every garden must have um, either, a, a, of course, a olive tree is a must, a grapevine, and then maybe an apricot or a plum tree or an almond tree and tangerine. These are all part of part of our terroir and our culture. And the people of this landscape is a mixture of, of many, many occupants and uh, immigrants and uh, the people who came and occupied this land. Uh, so going back, we had the the Louis, that they were uh, contemporaries with Hittites, and then Lydians, and then Ionians, and then Persians took over for a brief period. Uh, and this caused a lot of migration. For example, people from this area, the Ionians, they escaped from the Persians and moved on to the islands and as far as Marseille in France they moved from Anatolia. And when they were moving, they took their uh, olive cuttings or uh, grape cuttings, and they produced these things in their new homeland. And the new people uh, who came here um, learned the traditions of the older people. So, um, the you know, in this landscape, Romans used to make the, Garum, you know, this sauce that they make from fish intestines, uh, okay. it's a fermented product. Mm -hmm. And they know how to uh, press olives to make oil, and they knew how to make the sublime uh, thing, which is we call wine today. And for them, it was a lifesaver because the, uh, the water that they were drinking uh, was not and clean, so they needed to uh, sterilize it in a way, and wine was mainly used in uh, sterilization of water uh, and also as a means of uh, enjoyment and, uh, and higher uh, um, ideals, thinking, uh, philosophy, etc., but mainly for uh, daily consumption. Right, so, right. Um, so we have this mosaic in Urla. Yes, it, it is a mosaic. And I love, yes, the, the references to the history that actually, you know, cultivates the culture that you are now living. And I mean, olives alone, for example, Pelin, I mean, um, I just had the pleasure of going to... Um, a 2000 year old wild olive grove and in Greece, but um, it was it was pretty incredible. Um, but, and you grow olives. So tell me a little bit, tell us a little bit, Palin, from your point of view, from your perspective, um, what terroir means to you and in, in terms of your growing. Well, um... Lydia had a very nice introduction about Urla Peninsula, and uh, the, I want to start first, of course, with the um, landscape and the uh, soil. The landscape we have here, uh, it's surrounded by thousand year old olives, uh, olive trees, which is called Arcan, it's a native variety, 
and there are um, estimated 5,000 to 6,000 year old uh, olive trees in Orla Peninsula because uh, for me, Orla means uh, I can uh, the variety, you need the variety of um, olives. Uh, it's not because uh, I'm growing olives, but uh, when we started to plant our first uh, olive orchard in 1990s, there was uh, this Klesomenae ancient olive oil mill um, historical place started to uh, invade it and uh, maybe a couple or three more years later and then we found out that Lezemini before Christ five to six years um, early and uh, there was this ancient industrial the first in the world industrial olive oil mill and mm. uh, made us very very excited about it because it's the land of you know uh, the industry where it became uh, from the olive oil also wine and it was imported to uh, the other um, coast and the islands of Greece and the whole Aegean and the Mediterranean and it was a huge land of olives and they are kind of disappeared in in the time when mm. the um, Actually, uh, real immigrants from uh, Greece, uh, when uh, th there was the um, uh, after Turkish Republic, uh, they had to go back their homelands to, to Greece, and then new people arrived, as uh, we just said, or Yugoslavia, and they had no idea about how to take care of olives, so they didn't really uh, pay more attention, and then. Uh, in the time, uh, the, the old varieties became really, really tall uh, because they didn't know how to prune and they didn't know how to, you know, um, water them or to, mm -hmm. to make the tree really healthy growing. So, so they, they left uh, in the ground and uh, one other, uh, after a year, uh, they harvested it and they uh, found out that there is a um, very special olive called kurma. It's the only olive that can be uh, eaten by, right away from the um, tree or it drops on the ground and it's, it's really um, tasty and uh, it doesn't need any treatment at all. It's just made and it's what the climate makes it. And are you cultivating those? Are you actually is that in any kind of abundance currently? Um, it's not in any abundance, but uh, there are uh, in our in our land in our land, there are 120 of them, and wow. they are really really old, maybe seven or eight hundred years old. And uh, but when we turn, uh, I mean, uh, back to the conversation to climate change and. Are the varieties the most um, intolerant to the climate change because they don't give much fruits. Each year it really drops very much, and uh, we don't have that much um, fruit at all. Uh, and I believe it's the uh, climate change, and it's too hot, and uh, they don't need water because they had roots on the ground, maybe more than nine or ten meters deep. Uh, I mean, they, they know where to um, get their, you know, water. We don't water that all trees. Uh, it shows us um, actually uh, uh, that we have to focus on native varieties. It's, it could be maybe olives, it, it is uh, maybe wines, and uh, it may be some other products like we can call um, very nice um, um, um Alan, I'm, I'm if I could just interrupt you for a second it's I I think it's hard to hear you if you could just um speak a little bit louder um because okay. I'm finding it hard I'm, I'm not sure if it's just my computer but just speak um a little louder if you can um I heard everything you said but um I also wanted to sort of draw attention to the the 
both of you have worked um, separately and together on many projects um, to promote agriculture in Urla specifically, right? Either, so you've formed associations like Slow Food, uh, Urla, um, Urla Wine Route. Um, you've helped establish festivals like the Wild Edible Greens and Artichoke. And you work with students as well as other NGOs and food cooperatives like Fisherman Co-op and uh, probably a lot more. Um, so I was just wondering if you could share some of your experiences um, with working with these kinds of people and, and um, organizations, ha how it is impacting your work. Um, I think insights to that, to share with us can give us inspiration to do similar things wherever we are. Um, would you like to carry on with that, Helen? And then we'll pass it over to Bill Gale. Yes. Um, Saltwood uh, was a very um, uh, exciting group of uh, our peninsula, which uh, Bilge was the leader of our commitment. And uh, together we had uh, many projects uh, with Slow Food. And uh, I can just point out some few. And uh, one was very related to olive oil tasting. We had olive oil tasting um, courses to be able to um, give good respect and um, valuable uh, and um, really high um, potential of the olive oil used in our culinary. Uh, so we made really uh, focused on the growers and uh, for the you know restaurants, local restaurants, and uh, the consumers. And we had many guests because uh, it was a very um, uh, well done uh, two day courses. And uh, we focused on um, really our gastronomy. And uh, there were people coming from the food, which was very exciting. And they were also from some uh, other um, slow food members. And uh, the other projects we did together was uh, probably uh, we it will mention uh, edible um, wild greens and it's the very traditional of Orla and um, and also artichoke festival and it was um, the only geographical indication of origin uh, vegetable that we grow in Orla Peninsula and we had mm -hmm. the very good impact on uh, overall Turkey and internationally and uh, in the very first year, we had 250,000 people in three days. It was really, really amazing. And uh, the, the combination of uh, Orla Sakız artichoke uh, and olive oil makes a great uh, product. And I knew what, when I was uh, really growing uh, olive oil that uh, the aroma inside of olive oil is really rich and re really good quality. When you taste uh, on nose and uh, on the mouth, uh, artichoke, and I had no idea about it. And it's really exciting because it's the whole peninsula is growing artichoke and uh, our olive oil is smelling really beautifully uh, artichoke inside it, doing nothing and also almonds and also uh, apricots and uh, the other fruits we taste. And this is what our terroir of Orla Peninsula shows us, which is very rich and uh, soil and the wheat and the, you know, uh, all four seasons gives us this um, privilege to grow our best um, uh, production and produ mm -hmm. produce of uh, artichokes and oil together and uh, I believe uh, those together and, and with the wines and all the path which is um, olive oil uh, path is also uh, became uh, more and more popular uh, in peninsula so each year we had um, really privileged guests and tourism also 
uh, became uh, a very um, uh, after especially the COVID and it became very popular and people like to be here and uh, mm -hmm. hospitality uh, makes us really um, happy and uh, this is our major uh, business in the recent year. So are you finding Bill Gate too in your experience are you finding that tourism and um, just the consumers that attend um, these festivals or these events, are they becoming more educated? Are they supportive? Bill Gay, how, how are you finding that? Uh, definitely they are. Uh, first of all, a look at the Artichoke Festival. It had a huge impact on the growers. Uh, a lot, many more people started uh, growing artichokes instead of just, uh, I don't know, uh, watermelon or peppers, uh, you know, they focused on a certain product. And uh, we always promoted, like Helene said, the uh, geographical uh, marked uh, Urla artichoke, uh, which is called um, uh, Stakuz uh, artichoke, because it has a white color. Um, and uh, the awareness of the consumers and the growers uh, was high, high, uh, uh, highlighted and, and, and they realized that this is the product they can succeed and make money with. Uh, so, uh, you know, parts of our efforts with Pelin in Slow Food Urla, which is now uh, independent of Slow Food, but still continuing the work and the philosophy as doal sofra, uh, which is a Turkish word, with um, more members than uh, 60 or 70 members. We are promoting uh, the, uh, uh, the landscapes uh, use as agricultural landscape and not uh, having the uh, fields turn into uh, residential areas because there's a huge pressure from bigger cities. Uh, because of its nice weather and proximity to the beautiful beaches and a big auto route, everybody wants a second house here or they want to, you know, because of COVID and other things, they want to move out of the big cities. But this is creating a big problem for a, a agricultural area such as Urla. So we had to find ways of, um, you know, just showing ways of, uh, promoting or uh, adding value to a uh, basic product. Like, let's take olive oil. Um, you know, they've been uh, pressing olive oil in Urla since uh, Klozemenai times. But when we came here, unfortunately, there were so many uh, uh, mistakes about uh, the procedure of collecting olives from the tree and pressing them and how to keep them. There were so many wrong uh, knowledge. Mm -hmm. And we worked with experts uh, as a group. We brought them uh, and gave um, really uh, reasonably priced uh, lessons to people who want to join. And we taught them how to taste, uh, what to look for in a good olive oil and how to press it. Mm -hmm. And thanks to uh, Pelin and some new uh, comers into olive making, uh, olive oil making, Urla. Now we, everybody in their houses have wonderful, beautiful olive oils, really grassy smelling, uh, with a burning quality, perfect olive oils. We're so well, lucky that we could achieve that. And I, the same thing with wine i'm sorry go ahead no 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 i'm 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 just really um happy to hear that i mean the the the, the thing is is it it teaches you're basically teaching consumers uh the value of their own product to appreciate right. their culture and um and create a product for today's market that can be viable that can be profitable that at the end of the day that's the bottom line right like there right. 
required. Yeah. That they have to make money from this uh, produce that they're growing. Otherwise, it's more profitable to sell it for construction, for housing. Sure. So that's what, and the same thing is true with uh, wine. You know, they've been making wine here uh, in their houses for their own consumption, which is good, but they never invested in uh, knowledge or uh, modern knowledge or modern technology. So the wines were not up to uh, international standards. Um, they didn't know how to uh, age wine. They didn't know how to keep wine. So, uh, but, you know, fermentation is easy. You just take grapes, uh, crush them and leave them and uh, it will be something like a wine. But you need to uh, preserve it. You need to know how to keep it not oxidized and you need to know which grapes to pick for longer aging etc and with the new winemakers or uh, labels like ulige coming into this area um, everybody learned that uh, you know it needs and takes uh, knowledge and experience to make wine it's, mm -hmm. I was just reading uh, one of the comments from Arlene about the water. Um, is that why Jesus turned water into wine? I'm not sure <laughs> where that fits into this now, but um, can we talk about climate change a little bit? I'd like to know how you guys are feeling about climate change. I mean, you just experienced some horrific fires that were, you know, all through um, Turkey and Greece. We've experienced it. Northern Canada, Western Canada, um, in, the, in the United States, they had terrific fires. Um, what's, your, what's, what's your feelings about it? How are you guys combating it? What kind of support are you getting or feeling from, from your people? Anyone? Okay. Well, uh, we've experienced a very big fire two years ago in the peninsula. It started very close to our farm and then it spread it and it went all the way to Izmir. And I mean, thousands and thousands of hectares had burned. And it uh, roughly took about a month. They couldn't stop it. And uh, we didn't learn from that fire, unfortunately, that uh, what had to be done, uh, what we had the first actions uh, about to um, make the fire under control, uh, but we couldn't. So um, the, the last fire we had was in arms a month. Uh, I mean, uh, if I can say about uh, olive trees and um, in Antalya, Managat region, uh, 500 thousands of olive trees had burned. I mean, it's an amazing, amazing uh, number of- uh, That's heartbreaking. It is really, it is. And the, um, uh, the, the, the professors are talking about that. The fires will happen mm -hmm. eventually in the next few years, maybe there will be more fires but we have to learn how to control uh, fires and how can we make some uh, sudden um, um, proportions maybe about it. Maybe we have to do some. Uh, how is the recovery? Like what is the recovery like of all, uh, all the um, production, any of the agriculture that was burned? It wasn't just olive trees. You know, there would be uh, farmlands and, and a great many other things. How, how, is, how do you come back from that? Well, um, after a burnt area, you have to wait at least one year because the soil mm. has to recover itself, which it can. I mean, it also does the same. I mean, there shouldn't be any new plantation be done. At least two years need to be... Um, Waited, and uh, because um, the, the pines here in the Mediterranean area, uh, the um, seeds 
have the uh, capability of uh, reshoot again, even if it's the you know two to hundred thousand uh, centigrade Celsius. Uh, it's the DNA inside of it, so it's the good part. But to be able to have the spec, it needs maybe fifty to sixty years. We don't have that much time. Mm -hmm. When we think about the olive orchards, I mean, it's again you have to wait at least ten years to have the um, really good fruit uh, to be able to financially recover. Uh, it's a very long, long time, and uh, it's it's going to be difficult. And the impacts of the heat, uh, I mean, we, we, we felt the whole you know, sky had, you know, gray uh, because of the fire. We couldn't see the sun, the, the, there was a cloud, and it's just covered, all the sky was covered. And the heat was, the temperatures were so high. And of course, any kind of olive uh, has really, um, wasn't happy because of not, not enough, uh, you know, light and hot. And if we can't uh, have the opportunity to water, that's a problem. How, how are the grapes affected, um, Bill Gay? How are the your products impacted by? How are they in general impacted by climate change? Um, um, and what are you doing? What do you do to? I mean, obviously you can't yourself reverse climate change, it would be nice if you could, but <laughs> what, what things are you putting in place to, to uh, help ensure sustainability? Yeah, I think for us, the, the, uh, by the way, we had fires before the, the southern fires in, in the south of Turkey, the big fires in Mula and Antalya and Manavgat. But uh, even uh, part of our vineyard was burned. And uh, I saw some olive trees burning and it was so sad to see this 100 year old tree, oh. like an old person and it's burning for hours. They don't normally uh, put down the fires on olive trees first because uh, pine trees are more uh, dangerous. So they let them uh, burn. By itself until it burns down. So it, it was a terrible sight to see. And, uh, and part of my vineyard was burned too. So we were very nervous. Uh, we were just throwing dirt on uh, fire and trying to uh, stop it. Mm -hmm. But for us, the main uh, problem is drought, uh, drought, drought. And uh, and uh, uh, the uh, the water table is getting lower and lower every year because uh, uh, everybody is like uh, moving to the country like we did, but uh, uh, they are not uh, doing agriculture, they're just living and they are uh, opening more wells and there's drought and uh, more wells uh, and result lower uh, water table. Right. Um, what are you doing to, you know, um, to aid yourselves? What, uh, you know, we have been from the beginning uh, worked with an ancient system of grape growing, which doesn't rely on irrigation, which is dry farming. So what you, you, you don't irrigate the grapes except for the first year when they're setting root deep in the ground. Um, so after the first year, you just uh, cut the uh, surface roots and, pro uh, and just uh, promote the uh, deep roots to uh, go even deeper to find the water. Um, like I said, um, if we grow produce that's uh, appropriate for the soil and the terroir, the climate, then we don't run into too many troubles. Here, uh, this land has chalk and clay and it just holds water. You don't need to irrigate for certain uh, products, for certain uh, varieties like grapes or certain grapes or certain olive trees. And even some tomatoes here that I know they don't need too much irrigation. Hmm. Is anybody is anybody 
um, educating other farmers and producers. Like, I, I wonder about the role of, you know, government and marketing boards, tour uh, not tourism, but uh, people that are in the agricultural build business, what are they doing to, are they um, enlightening other growers to utilizing traditional methods? Because those methods were successful for a reason, right? Is anything going on? And well, I, Renee, to tell you the truth, I haven't seen that. I, you know, it's just the uh, the old folk who know how to tend the land. You just have to learn from them. There are no books on this. Um, everything is modern, modern, and uh, you know. Uh, you just have to learn from the old folks who are disappearing one by one. They're not farming anymore. Their children are not farming. They're going to the cities. They're getting uh, education, higher uh, education, and they don't want to go back to the field. So, mm, well, so the, it's up to people's own conscience to to find ways of. Uh, just conserving energy and conserving water. Well, I think this is one of our goals, and this is, you know, one of the at the core of what what we do, what why we do what we do, right? Is is to inform and enlighten and and share stories like yours, and um, to make people aware. And we've heard a lot of stories. I mean, again, when we were in Greece, um, we were talking to a young waiter at a restaurant and you know he he's been he was in the big city for five years he went to school he got his education and he had had it he would you know the fires the last fires just recently you know you couldn't see your hand in front of your face or you couldn't sit outside and he said he was going back to his family farm you know he had learned a bunch of stuff and he was going to go back there and i've heard that story not a lot but you know uh, enough that it's it's you know encouraging um uh, i kind okay. of want to sort of segue from that into you know what support is out there for people like you you know and what information is being delivered to consumers that um can encourage them to buy product from you know, people that are doing the right thing and that sort of, and I wonder what the role is in marketing and government and maybe um, um, Ismail, you, could you talk a little bit to that? Uh, well, I mean, the response in, in Turkey uh, from uh, the, the central government uh, has not been, uh, to say the least, satisfactory, I think. Uh, uh, I mean, we, we hear from Bilge and, and, and Pelin uh, uh, what they have achieved, but uh, it's been a very difficult thing, thing to do. I mean, dealing with the uh, uh, administration uh, <clears throat> and, and what, what they have built, and now you have the climate uh, on top of it uh, mm -hmm. as an extra uh, issue. But this uh, last, uh, uh, I mean, big, big fires, uh, I think there has been such a big public sort of uh, interest. I mean, interest in the sense that, you know, it is serious uh, because it's, 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 it's so huge. So I think in a way I, the, the, there's increasingly more citizens sort of demand uh, which governments and authorities have to respond. Mm -hmm. uh, I think local authorities as well. I mean, you have the central government and the local authorities, uh, 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 because at the end of the day, it is the mayors who need to get <laughs> elected. So they need to do something for the uh, uh, constituents. I think that's where things can happen. Uh, and there are also some, some NGOs, but I think, this is also a Mediterranean problem. I mean, it was in Sicily, it was in Greece, it was in Turkey. It wasn't accidental. Uh, it was so everywhere. Think, it was I, everywhere. I think, it was a Canadian, North American yeah. problem. Yes, it's a global issue. So, I mean, 
than the EU, which famously put together an agricultural, you know, common agricultural policy, there has to be a coordination at that level, because uh, you're not fighting a fire in your vicinity, you're fighting something big, uh, environment and climate. Uh, uh, so I think uh, that there has to be a coordination at that, at that level. Uh, at, at the EU, of course, I mean, at the UN level, uh, I mean, the, the, the global level, but also at the Mediterranean level, where, where they have uh, common issues. Uh, but I think the younger generations uh, and, and also this, I think food increasingly, I mean, like what Bill Gay and Pelling were telling, I mean, Ula wasn't on the map, e even in Turkey. <laughs> it is on the map in Turkey you know, yeah. as an interesting place because of food. You know, Artichoke Festival. I mean, I set up a, a, a center in, in university in Izmir uh, on, on creativity. Uh, and, and the first thing that you were going to do was to look at the economic impact of the Artichoke Festival on, on the local sort of producers. Like Bill Gates says, uh, uh, terroir can easily turn into real estate. Sure. So how do you make sure then the, 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 the farmers producing value added artichokes or go into wine or, or gastronomy so they can have waiters with, with higher wages, with more information. Uh, uh, so uh, in, the, in, in that sense, uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, I mean, Ulla has become so uh, 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 successful, uh, and it wasn't on the map because near. I mean, Izmir is big. Also, we talk about archaeology, but you have bigger archaeology like Ephesus. Mm -hmm. uh, so it wasn't easy to put Ulla on the map, and you have it's a much more interesting sort of uh, a summer. Uh, uh, <clears throat> residences in Cheshme uh, and Alachati. So I think this, what they have done, bringing producers and uh, chefs, restaurants together, and now you have a new generation, like the, uh, the, the person you were telling in, in Greece, right. who look at food, growing food, you know, making interesting things from food, gastronomy, restaurants. Uh, so that, uh, this is my future now. My future is not living in the city, you know, working in a, f uh, a factory or, or, or working in, a, in an office. My, my future is, you know, living in places like Ula and then make, I make a living from producing right. food, involving food, gastronomy, and then uh, gastronomy related, food related tourism. So I think that pressure is not felt by the authorities. So that, that, that's one positive thing. So your point about, um, um, you know, consumers, citizens, people, starting at that, at that level, having them understand and then demand better products and yeah. curious about that, that starts because we know the support isn't really coming from government. I mean, mm -hmm. Um, Ismail, you sent us a report. It was from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. The report was done by them, the UNDP, and the UN Environmental Program. So they, they created this extensive, I don't know how many pages was it, hundreds of pages. I haven't read it all, but I, I would like to read a couple of um, excerpts from it because this is what is astounding to me is that, you know, agriculture, you farmers, you, you growers and producers have so little, you're, you're providing and developing so much on your own with so little support really, and just through tenacity and hard work. And yet the government and the su supplements that are out there for alternative ways of, of growing is actually at the detriment of our climate, our soil, our water, all that. So I just wanted to read quickly. Um, 
um, the policies that shape how and where we use land and other natural resources to feed the world's population have extraordinary potential to promote healthy consumption, sustainable production patterns, which in turn are key to are key to reducing emissions and protecting our planet and its biodiversity. So we know that growing good plants, good food, and good you know trees and is is good for the whole planet. That's a given. We know that. Um, as this this report demonstrates, the way governments around the world support agriculture is a factor in the global and environmental challenges that agri-food systems are fa facing. They're actually almost working against you. And this is where it gets really juicy. Current support for agricultural producers worldwide works against the attainment of the sustainable developmental goals, the targets of the Paris Agreement and our future and our common future. This support is biased towards measures that are harmful and unsustainable for nature, climate, nutrition, and health, while disadvantaging women and other smallholder farmers in that in a sector. At a time when many countries' public finances are constrained, particularly in the developing world, global agricultural support to producers currently accounts for almost $540 billion US a year. Over two thirds of this support is considered price distorting and largely harmful to the environment. It makes me wanna shoot myself. Like, this is yeah. what is in place. Yeah, how, think, do you, how do you even survive? You know what I mean? This is the big machine that that you're working against. Yeah, yeah I think, I mean, so, such reports are important because uh, FAO, uh, Food and Agricultural Organization within EU, I mean, uh, uh, United Nations, they influence policy. Uh, and, and, and we need data for people to be able to see. I think those numbers, you know, because people hear about climate change, people hear about how food is important and, 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 the, and the food subsidies. Uh, uh, but when those numbers are <laughs> sort of uh, 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 put in front of them, then, then take, they take notes and hopefully uh, right. it, will, it will influence policy for, for, for better. We need to, yes. I think you put, did you put the link to this yeah, um, yeah. in the chat? So, so if anyone who wants, they can download it. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. it's it's quite something. Um, um, but, but, uh, I would like to give uh, a very brief um, numbers of United Nations World Tourism Organization report uh, about uh, two, in the year of 2015, 68% uh, of population of the world is going to live in the cities and uh, they are going to control 85% uh, of them will control the economy. I think it's, it's, it's really important that uh, the, the people who are going to live in the cities will decide the future of the sustainable and the world and food and everything and uh, mm -hmm. th that's why i think it's a paradox, is isn't it? it is and uh, and uh, one very new um study has been done last week uh, this is a very young nice guy i knew him from uh, since he was maybe 10 and he, he made his master in sustainability analysis of solar assisted organic oil production at our olive oil mill, which it is uh, runs with uh, solar energy. And in the end, it shows us Arcangel variety, native Urla, Arcangel variety olives, olive oil, has the most negative carbon footprint. And I think it's the very, very important um, point that every region has to protect and has to grow its native uh, origins. I mean, it would be olives, wines, and other products like vegetables and fruits. And uh, 
this is very important. Of course. And, and, and you need support to, to encourage more farmers to, or more producers to um, do that work, you know? And so with the subsidies and, and that sort of thing, that, that would help a great deal. They're just going into the wrong di direction. Um, um, I think, if I may, yes. um, like is Ismail said, you know, uh, the governments are not doing much. The FAO is going the totally the wrong way. So I think what we need to do is uh, to educate people, folks like us, because um, they can or we can force the governments or like Ismail said, uh, the mayorships or whatever in the local level to act the way uh, we want them to. But for that, we need to uh, be informed of another. You see, we're not, the world is not that big anymore. We're living in a little village. And, you know, look at COVID. That made us understand that uh, everyone is connected. And it's the same thing with the um, environmental challenges. Uh, we don't look, need to look at the numbers. It's coming with thunders. You know, the yeah. environmental problems are coming with thunders, with their uh, fires, uncontrollable fires, the draft, the uh, drought, I mean. And uh, so we will see people not being able to feed themselves. We will see people uh, in really bad situation. And then the numbers will not be enough. So, uh, and I'm sorry to say this will not be uh, so far. Uh, and no matter what uh, measures you take in your uh, small uh, business, like my business or Payne's business, uh, we are uh, organically certified. We're trying to consume uh, very minimal uh, resources. She's talking about solar energy uh, and all those things doesn't matter when somebody is building a, like a golf course in the middle of a desert, you know, so exactly. people have to be aware of what's going on around them and, so, and support businesses like. Uh, well, that was my next question. How can suit consumers influence sustainability? in in these areas how can they make a difference other you know by supporting you guys obviously by buying your products sure but you know a bottle a couple of bottles of wine or a liter of olive oil you know collectively what can we what do you suggest we do i have my ideas but what do you suggest we do I, I think the uh, organizations, uh, NGOs, uh, there are a lot of organizations who are doing a great deal to educate people with the dangers of uh, global warming and, and food scarce and what have you. So people are getting more and more aware of these things and through uh, internet connectivity we are uh, aware of what's going on in other parts of the world. So I think we need to uh, to just uh, join in uh, one of those uh, groups and help with their efforts in, uh, in giving, you know, um, information about uh, what's going on with why big businesses are not good for the environment, the, why Right. the governments are supporting big businesses i mean people just need to open their eyes because it's their future and it's their children's future it's educate yourself um there's a lot about that you know you have to educate yourself ask a lot of questions don't be afraid to write letters to your political um you know uh uh people that are running for government in your areas um, associations you can form associations like small farmers can get together and promote their uh, uh, whatever their agenda yeah. 
I mean, it's so true what you said. Uh, we're a small, small world. I mean, through COVID and everybody had to Zoom and, you know, connect through video. And we, we created a bunch of talks and talking to people all over the world. And then I just did a little bit of traveling. I went to um, many, uh, several countries. And at the end of the day, the conversations were all the same, whether it was personal, from a personal point of view of what they went through, through the last 18 months, what their businesses. So on a hospitality um, level, you know, what they were going through with regard to staff issues or this or that. Um, everyone had the same comments and concerns and fears and, you know, hopes as well. And it really makes us makes me that much more aware of how how similar we actually are even though we live in completely different areas of the world in different regions and sometimes eating different food which isn't so different when you dig down a little bit do a little research everything came from somewhere else as you were explaining in your earlier and the the process of all the different nationalities you know creating right. culture that you live now right I think um the, the 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 social media i mean what bill Gates was referring to the world becoming small i mean if i'm not uh, mistaken on instagram food is the most <laughs> shared uh, sort of uh, item uh, because uh, and i'm sure we all see now you know people take the picture i think and also on television uh, and then media, we have uh, very popular food programs, you know, the chefs competing and all that. I think uh, the, the, the media has a role. Yes, it is uh, <clears throat> uh, good to look at, but there are also real issues behind it. I think that's another way of uh, raising awareness, uh, getting engaged with the uh, media, television channels, bloggers, uh, <clears throat> Instagram. Yes, uh, it is photogenic food, <laughs> uh, but there are also real dangers. So I think that could be part of the, the, the uh, education and then raising awareness. Mm, yes, good point. Uh, Pellin, I have a question for you from the audience. Um, have you measured, this is from Ethan uh, Nidis, who we visited in Greece and took me to those ancient olive, the wild olive trees. Thanks for taking me there, Ethan. Anyways, he's got a question. Have you measured the polyphenols in your olive oil varieties? Yes, yes, we measure the um, culprits and uh, early harvest. And could you explain polyphenols maybe to those of, those of uh, the audience that might not know? Okay, polyphenols are the chemical uh, that very we want in uh, richness in olive oil. Uh, when we taste an olive oil, if it's too bitter and pungent, we can say that it's high in phenols, which is uh, rich in um, um, very good antioxidants, and it's uh, good for very good for health. And yeah. uh, yes, we measure them. Um, and do you put those kinds of uh, do you put the um, the outcomes on your bottles or labels? Labels? No, we don't. But in recent times, uh, some producers uh, start putting their polynols. But uh, in in the law, uh, you don't have to. It's not a necessity. Right. Uh, it's important how you store your olive oil because of if course. you can keep it. Uh, in good conditions, you lose it. So it's quite risky if you can't keep the storage well. Uh, but uh, our polyphenols uh, differ from 500 to 1,000 and uh, 12,000. And uh, I mean, the machinery is very important. It's very much sense and difference in, in a polyphenol. And uh, as I said, it, it really differs from the climate each year to year. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the early season uh, 
system, uh, we, we can have about 900 right. to 1,000 polyphenols, which means quite good. Right. And that, that, that's um, the big health benefit, one of the major health benefits in olive oil for those of you. And, and just in case, like, what is the best way to store olive oil? I know cool, cool dark, right? Cool, dark, and uh, no oxygen. Uh, it has to be really uh, without oxygen and water. And uh, yeah, yeah, it has to be dark. And, um, and drink it every day. <laughs> yeah, it has to be in good, good uh, conditions. Climate well, design actually, places. The, Ethan it has this trick where, um, and we can incorporate both of your Bill Gay and your olive oil. So he takes a a little a shot glass of red wine and he puts a little a half of you know an ounce of olive oil or half an ounce of olive oil and a little bit of red wine and he drinks it back every morning and he wow. he believes that that is the the recipe because <laughs> the wine tempers the olive oil in turkey uh, people before they start drinking King, they uh, drink uh, a little bit of olive oil just to save their stomach, no. line their stomach. So it's a good you idea. Know, that and pickle juice. That, that, I will never forget that. Drinking a big, big glass of pickle juice. It was the best. Listen, I think we have come close to uh, where we're maybe a little bit over anyway uh, for our hour. I just thank you guys so much for, for joining and sharing your um, thoughts and ideas and, and um, suggestions. And I hope we all take them to heart and learn. Um, I wanna thank those of you that attended. Um, of course, we totally appreciate your ongoing support. And uh, if, you've got, if you've learned anything, share it with your colleagues, sign up for our newsletter. Um, to tell us what you want to know, what you, uh, questions that you have. Uh, Pellen, Bill, Bill Gay, and Ismail, thank you so very, very much, as always. Oh, thank, th so thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Rana. Thank you, Arlene, for organizing this. And great to be with you, Bill Gay. Pellen, <laughs> all the best. And thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Elijah Vineyards. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you from Oliverla. <laughs>